John walked with Jesus and was taught by Jesus. He went through the trauma of the cross and defeat and marveled in the experience and wonder of the resurrection. Years passed. He witnessed and labored. Though only a fisher's boy around the Sea of Galilee, the world became his horizon. He changed from a son of thunder to a man of love. He suffered for his master. He longed for Jesus. He wanted the world to know and to see him again. Others had given their account of the events that shook the world and changed his life. Now the Holy Spirit inspired him to write his gospel. The purpose was clear. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Each of the biblical books, of course, has its own special, unique purpose. But in a sense, the intent of the Gospel of John is the main purpose of all the scriptures. Jesus himself said that they bear testimony about him. In the New Testament, writers were likewise inspired by the Holy Spirit who came to glorify Jesus. Another important text which highlights the main purpose of all the Holy Scriptures is found in the Apostle Paul's first letter to Timothy. All Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. The Bible is amazing. The Word of God has a very practical purpose and it has proved that it is able to fulfill the purpose as no other book the scriptures are trustworthy and reliable in helping us to find Jesus and true doctrine. This leads us to reflect on the purpose and ministry of Ellen White. Why did the Holy Spirit call and use and inspire her? What was her role compared to the role of the Bible? Let us listen to some of the answers that she herself gives to these questions. The Bible is the only rule of faith and doctrine. The Bible contains all the principles that men need to understand in order to be fitted either for this life or for the life to come. God has not only revealed to us the doctrine of the atonement, holding out the hope of eternal life, but His words are manna from heaven for the soul to feed upon and receive spiritual strength. The Bible is the great standard of right and wrong, clearly defining sin and holiness. Its living principles running through our lives like threads of gold are our only safeguard in trial and temptation. We must study to find out the best way in which to take up the review of our experiences from the beginning of our work. We then took the position that the Bible, and the Bible only, was to be our guide and we are never to depart from this position. Ellen White's position is clear. The Bible and the Bible alone is the rule for faith and doctrine. This has always been the Seventh-day Adventist position. The Bible contains all the information, all the principles essential for salvation. Ellen White never considered her writings to be on a par with the Bible, a part of the canon. What do we mean by the canon? The word itself means a measuring rod and it is used as a reference to the books of the Bible because they together are normative for all Christian teaching. On the one hand, it implies that all doctrines are to be deduced from the Bible. On the other hand, it implies that all other writings and authorities have to submit to the authority of the Bible. The Bible is the great test by which all human authority is to be measured. But this does not mean that God's Holy Spirit has only inspired those people who wrote the Bible. The scriptures themselves attest to a number of genuine prophets whose messages never were intended to be part of the canon. In Old Testament times we find prophets like Nathan and Gad who even wrote books. In the New Testament Agabus is one of the many itinerant prophets, and the seven daughters of Philip in Caesarea are examples of prophets who functioned locally. Though these prophets were genuine and inspired by the Holy Spirit, their writings or messages are not included in the biblical canon. That was not part of the purpose 
for their ministry. Let us make this point very clear. The writings of Ellen White do not belong to the canon. She never intended them to be the decisive authority for the teachings of the church. She draws a clear and definite line between the doctrinal authority of the Bible and her own position. This is illustrated by one of the most famous quotations from her pen. Little heed is given to the Bible, and the Lord has given a lesser light to lead men and women to the greater light. In comparing herself with the moon, Ellen White underscores that she only shared the light she received from a higher source. Throughout her ministry, she makes it clear that every experience and every gift, the prophetic gift included, is to be tested by the Bible, the Word of God. In this DVD, therefore, we describe the ministry of Ellen White on the basis of a biblical model for a non-canonical prophet. The Spirit was not given, nor can it ever be bestowed, to supersede the Bible. For the Scriptures explicitly state that the Word of God is the standard by which all teaching and experience must be tested. Isaiah declares, to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this Word, it is because there is no light in them. Ellen White's stand that doctrines should be based on and argued from the Scripture alone, the great principle of the Protestant Reformation, sola scriptura, was heeded by her husband, James White. As the editor of the Adventist magazine, Review and Herald, James highlighted this principle. The Bible is a perfect and complete revelation. It is our only rule of faith and practice. But this is no reason why God may not show the past, present, and future fulfillment of His Word. In these last days, by dreams and visions according to Peter's testimony. True visions are given to lead us to God and to His written Word. But those that are given for a new rule of faith and practice, separate from the Bible, cannot be from God and should be rejected. Every Christian is therefore in duty bound to take the Bible as a perfect rule of faith and duty. He should pray fervently to be aided by the Holy Spirit in searching the Scriptures for the whole truth and for his whole duty. He is not at liberty to turn from them to learn his duty through any of the gifts. We say that the very moment he does, he places the gifts in the wrong place and takes an extremely dangerous position. So the writings of Ellen White do not belong to the canon. What then was her role? What was the purpose of her ministry? How did she understand it herself? The spiritualist movement has its modern origin in the 1840s in New England, in the same area where Ellen White ministered. Very early on, she was charged by some people with being a spiritualist. She strongly rejected this accusation by emphasizing that she pointed to the Bible and she further explained her own role. I recommend to you, dear reader, the Word of God as the rule of your faith and practice. By that Word we are to be judged. God has, in that Word, promised to give visions in the last days, not for a new rule of faith, but for the comfort of His people and to correct those who err from Bible truth. Let us understand this statement correctly. Ellen White does not claim that she is to be the judge of specific biblical interpretations or that the Bible has to be read through her eyes. Her view is exactly the opposite. It was characteristic of the spiritualists that their visions and messages replaced and exceeded the Bible. Ellen White reacted very strongly to them because her role was the exact opposite to lead people back to the Bible and to correct those who by listening to these spiritualists chose to follow another authority than the Word of God. Ellen White refers to the incident in Acts 10. This is a very telling story. The Old Testament very clearly taught that the gospel was to be proclaimed to all peoples. Jesus taught the disciples exactly the same. Yet prevailing prejudices 
kept the apostles from fulfilling the gospel commission. Contrary to these clear biblical principles, they closed the doors to the Gentiles. In this situation, God opened the eyes of Peter by showing him a vision. The vision taught him that Gentiles were to be accepted into the church on an equal footing with the Jews. So this is actually the function mentioned by Ellen White. Her role was to point people back to clear biblical principles, principles that may have been forgotten due to, for instance, personal prejudices. This is a role she repeatedly claims for herself, pointing people back to clear biblical principles. It is my first duty to present Bible principles. Then unless there is a decided, conscientious reform made by those whose cases have been presented before me, I must appeal to them personally. In these quotations, we have now seen three of the major purposes of the ministry of Ellen White. She was to comfort the people of God, to lead them back to biblical principles which they had left or ignored. And if that did not have the necessary effect, she had to deliver personal messages and give advice to leaders of the church whose influences were working against the principles of the Bible. In fulfilling that general role, Ellen White wrote and preached for specific purposes in a number of areas. Taking a closer look at some of these will help us to understand several of the questions that are often raised in relation to her ministry. My favourite and most refreshing encounter with the truth of the Seventh-day Adventist health message and the inspiration of Ellen White is found in her dialogue with Dr. Daniel Cress. A keen new Adventist who had previously been a Protestant pastor, Daniel was encouraged to go to medical school. He worked and studied with Dr. John Harvey Kellogg at Battle Creek. Daniel Cress's wife Loretta was also a doctor. Their church appointed them to various fields in New Zealand, Australia, the United Kingdom and the United States. A practicing medical missionary, Cress was a senior administrator at the Sydney Sanitarium and Hospital when it opened in 1903. He had been ill with pernicious anemia, pernicious because it was incurable. He had been told by Ellen White that his strict adherence to what he believed she had said was God's plan for eating was not health reform but actually health deform. He advocated and used a diet with no milk or eggs and only plant food. Back then it led to almost total disaster for him personally. However, several letters written to him changed his life for the better and forever. The most famous is the one from 1901 where he was told his condition would not improve unless he partook of eggs on a daily basis in grape juice. He was told by Ellen White there were essential properties in eggs that he needed. Now, over a century later, we have access to a letter he wrote in 1944 explaining how he heeded the advice and lived even longer than Ellen White herself. Actually, Ellen's 1901 letter was written from California and sent halfway around the world to where he was suffering. Following her personal advice to him, Cress regained his health and served his church outstandingly for decades to come. In his 1944 letter, he expresses his thankfulness that Ellen could have known that eggs could cure his pernicious anemia. Interestingly, vitamin B12, which is the outright cure for pernicious anemia, was not identified and named till 1948, four years after Cress gave Ellen White the credit for turning his health deform into good health, 43 years earlier. He lived into his 90s, serving his church well into his 80s. He saw the prophetic gift from a personal perspective for its sense in the area of health. Repeatedly, Ellen White wrote to educators and pastors and parents that physiology was to be taught to children at school so they could understand more about how to be healthy. I see in the story of vitamin B12 an indication of the validity of the gift and the balance the author wrote about so often. This illustrates how Ellen White's advice was intended for one particular individual and was not necessarily intended for everyone. At other times she did counsel church leaders for the work of the church as a whole as it progressed and developed. So far we've looked at three specific purposes of the ministry of Ellen White. But the role of Ellen White was many faceted. 
over the long period of service to God and to the church. One of her most significant contributions was the writing of the Conflict of the Ages series. The books in this series have often mistakenly been read as history books, but this was never their main purpose. In 1858, when Ellen White was still a young woman, God gave her a vision of a conflict that began in heaven when Lucifer challenged the authority of God. She was shown the war that ensued when Satan and his followers, the evil angels, were cast out of heaven. She wrote up the account of this vision in the next few months and published it. In the next few years, she uh, was given much more information. And so in 1884, she enlarged her account of the conflict in heaven and published it under the title of The Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 4. This was the fourth volume in a series of books that covered the whole Bible story. Four years later, in 1888, she enlarged it still further as she had spent two years in Europe in the meanwhile, and now she included much Reformation history in the 1888 edition. Now the book is called The Great Controversy Between Christ and Satan. In 1911, she made a few adjustments, including footnotes that she added, and uh, that book, known as The Great Controversy, is the capstone of the series which we refer to as the Conflict of the Ages series. These books cover everything in the Bible from the first verse of Genesis to the last verse of Revelation. What then was her purpose in writing The Great Controversy? To unfold the scenes of the great controversy between truth and error, to reveal the wiles of Satan, to present a satisfactory solution of the great problem of evil, to show the holy, unchanging nature of his law is the object of this book. The purpose of Alan White's panoramic visions was to show people the big picture and capture the vision of a God who had conquered evil on the cross of Calvary and was going to be victorious in the end. In writing The Great Controversy, Ellen White commissioned her secretaries to find for her use some of the most popular Protestant historians of her time with regard to historical details that could flesh out her visions. She willingly updated the material over time and did not consider herself an authority on historical matters relating to dates and places. This is confirmed in a letter written by Willie White and signed off by Ellen White herself, indicating her approval. Listen to the words of Willie. Regarding Mother's writings, she has never wished our brethren to treat them as authority on history. When Great Controversy was first written, she oftentimes gave a partial description of some scene presented to her. And when Sister Davis made inquiry regarding time and place, Mother referred her to what was already written in the books of Elder Smith and in secular histories. When Controversy was written, Mother never thought that the readers would take it as an authority on historical dates and use it to settle controversies. And she does not now feel that it ought to be used in that way. What we need to understand here is the purpose of these writings. They were to highlight the big picture of the plan of salvation, to turn the attention of the people to the major battle between good and evil as it has unfolded in the history of humankind. Taking that into consideration, we can easily see why there could be some inaccurate historical details in the book. They are totally insignificant in the light of the purpose for which the book was written. In dealing with this issue in the classroom, I use Messenger of the Lord by Herbert Douglas as our text. Herbert Douglas throughout points to the theme of the great controversy as Ellen White's major theological contribution and as the overall theme which permeates all of her writings. When speaking about some of the insignificant historical details in the book, The Great Controversy, Herbert Douglas approvingly quotes the study done at Andrews University by Donald R. McAdams. The Great Controversy was not conceived or developed primarily as a history, 
but rather as a book identifying the spiritual forces at work in history. We must take great controversy for what it is and what it was intended to be. Not a book simply to inform us about the past, not a book intended to be authoritative on the factual details concerning the activities of the reformers, but a book written to put the great controversy in its proper perspective. The examples we have given are only a few of the many examples which illustrate the various purposes of Ellen White's writings. We have seen that Ellen White never claimed any canonical role. She said the Bible alone is our source for establishing doctrine. She said it contains all that is necessary for humans to know in order to receive eternal life. Next, we've come to understand more the general purpose for which she was called and inspired by God. To comfort, to lead to the Bible, to advise the church in its development, to help individuals who faced difficult situations, and to paint the big picture of God's plan of salvation. Our next section will take a closer look at the messengers of God. What sort of people were they? The biblical examples given will help us to understand many of the questions relating also to the ministry of Ellen G. White. <music>